I'm Linda Cam. I'm the ID pharmacist at the VA in Tampa. And today I wanted to talk to you about treatment of clostridium infections um, in um, old therapies and looking at some new strategies. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone who was expecting a lecture on um, gram-negative resistance and ESBLs, but I thought this topic would be timely because of the new guidelines that are available on electronic form that came out um, two weeks ago, and the paper form is actually going to be published in, um, in May, first week of May, in infection um, in <coughs> excuse me, epidemiology. Um, so to start, um, I wanted to touch on the epidemiology pathogenesis of C. diff infections, uh, identify some risk factors for CDI, go into make perhaps some clinical presentation of a patient who presents with CDI, go over the um, uh, current and emergent therapies that um, are coming in the future, and then possibly looking at some agents that are still in investigation. So to start, I wanted to touch on some terminology because um, if you look at the literature, there's actually different terminology that's used and it's evolving. But currently, the terminology that we're using is um, Clostridium difficile infection. And um, up to about two years ago, um, you probably saw a lot of literature referring to CDAD, which is Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Um, but those are kind of synonymous now and the, it's defined as a patient who has diarrhea plus they have to have a positive stool test or a colonoscopic histopathologic finding revealing pseudomonas colonitis. So that's kind of the classic definition for CDI now. Um, other things you may read in the literature, and it's it's uh, important that you know this because if you're trying to figure out percentage and what the risk factors are for a patient, it may become kind of confusing because you'll see patients with antibiotic-associated diarrhea, where C. diff is only one of the causes of um, antibiotic-associated diarrhea, or AAD. It only counts for about a quarter of those cases. Other things that can cause antibiotic associated diarrhea include things um, like Staph aureus, Clostridium fringes, and other things which only make up about 2%, which include Salmonella, Klebsiella, Candida, and Clostridium difficile, um, or excuse me, and Candida. Pardon me here. Okay. Um, Another thing that you may see in the literature is what's referred to Clostridium difficile colitis, and this is really just referring to the underlying pathologic process that the patient is experiencing. Pseudomembranous colitis is usually um, the diagnosis by um, colonos colonoscopic or um, histopathologic um, on um, uh, exam where exudative lesions are present. And then lastly, toxic megacolon, um, which is radiologic or surgically diagnosed um, in the patient. So this is, oh, I apologize for the percentages being off here. But the big pie, where it says 70 to 80%, is supposed to be in the brown section. And it's basically referring to antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And you can see that three-fourths of the antibiotic-associated diarrhea are really from nonspecific causes. And it could be from osmotic diarrhea. Um, and I know tube feedings is just one of them um, that we refer to. Um, and costume difficile infection in the green only makes up about a quarter of the cases. This was a reference um, from John Bartlett that was published in a newsletter, but it's a very good comparison looking at the difference between CDI and AAD and um, how patients clinically present and also what can cause it. So drugs obviously can cause both. Um, CDI is usually not dose related. so. If a patient has antibiotic associated diarrhea, sometimes if we cut back the dose of the antibiotic, it may actually help them. Whereas in CDI cases, whether you give them very low dose of the antibiotic or any of the antibiotic, even one dose, whether it be around periop or preop, can actually cause CDI. Um, causes um, both in both instances is disruption of the colonic flora. Um, in most cases, some uh, the CDI can be self-limiting. Um, up to about 50% of, of us are um, asymptomatic carriers, 
of Clostrum difficile. So they may, if you culture their stool, they may have Clostrum difficile, but they may be totally asymptomatic and have formed stools and that sort of thing. Um, in CDI, you'll have patients with fever, the elevated WBC, the colitis, and um, possibly abdominal distension. Um, obviously, for CDI, we use the toxin assay in most cases, and in AAD, you will not see that. Um, and with AAD, I alluded to earlier, um, carbohydrates can be associated with AAD, and predominantly, CDI is only about a quarter of the cases. So the first case of pseudomembranous colitis was reported in the late 80s by Finney and Osler. And it was in a woman who was 22 years of age who had gastric tumors um, who developed this post-op diarrhea. And they really didn't know what it was from. She actually died post-op day number 15. And on autopsy, they found a sm her small bowel um, revealing um, diphtheric membranes. And they really didn't know what this was at that time. Um, classically, um, C. diff, as we know it, is um, primarily a nosocomial infection more than it is a community infection. However, we are seeing more in the community as well, and I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Pseudomembranous colitis was actually very rare pre-antibiotic age, and there was one piece of literature that referenced only at the Mayo Clinic, they only had four cases per year pre-antibiotic age, and now we see it pretty commonly and all the time. We know that with C. diff infections, the recurrence rate is very high. Um, anywhere between a third to two-thirds of the patients will have some um, recurrence in their lifetime, and it's not uncommon for them to have a recurrence. And we know that the estimated cost per case is about $3,600 a year, so it is a burden to the U.S. healthcare system. Um, as you can see in Canada, in the classic um, 027 strain that was associated with the outbreaks in Quebec um, in the early 2000 um, era. So comparing the 1991 data, there was only about 35 cases per 100,000 patient days um, in 1991. It jumped to um, about 156.3 cases per 100,000 patient days um, just within that decade. Um, and here in the United States, we're also seeing increasing incidence as well. Um, comparing 2000 to 2003, there was a 50% increase in the number of reported cases, um, and then almost a threefold increase if you look at um, 2000 to 2005. So clearly it's, it's a, um, a disease that is, uh, is of more importance and a burden to the U.S. health care system. Um, and for the first time now, um, the, there's been case reports of CDI in previously low-risk patients where we really didn't, you know, worry too much about C. diff. And these would include our healthy peripartum women, um, people living in the community that I alluded to. So they had no exposure to the healthcare system. Um, and then health, healthy persons without recent healthcare contact. So um, we are seeing it in the community now. This is just a, um, a picture of Clostrium difficile under electron microscope. As you can see, it's a, um, it's a gram-positive um, anaerobe um, spore-forming and toxin-producing um, organism. And this is a, just a uh, histopathologic um, slide of the... I don't know if you can see that very well, but this is the uh, uh, colon, and this is just inflammation, the exudate that's formed, pseudomembrous colitis. There's a lot of debris and inflammation that occurs um, when um, pseudomembrous colitis is present. Um, in the initial stages, you can see it's very hemorrhagic in appearance. Um, the, there's, um, you actually lose the um, normal mucosa folds that are present in the colon. See this kind of really smooth surface, which is abnormal. And um, you start to have these exudates start to form. And in the latter stages, when the pseudomembranes, you get this kind of verrucous looking volcanic eruptions are kind of a classic presentation of pseudomembranous colitis.
Um, there's a lot of inflammation that's present here. There's a lot of secretion, uh, mucousy material that's present. Uh, present. So initially you get the disruption of the colonic flora, whether it be from antibiotic or anti-neoplastic agents. You get colonization of the toxigenic C. diff, um, where it starts to produce toxins. And we know A, B are the, probably the most common, but there are other forms, the O27 strain, which we're going to be talking about, and then this new strain that I'm going to touch on. Um, toxin A and B are more responsible for the cytoskeletal damage, and A is mainly responsible for all that secretion of fluid, and th therefore you get that watery diarrhea. Who are at risk? Anybody who's been exposed to antibiotics, and I had said earlier, um, even patients that get pre-op antibiotics, it could just be that one dose um, before they go to surgery. Any hospitalized patients, it's been reported that if you keep a patient in the hospital within one week, their risk is only about 1%, but if you keep them great in the hospital for about within that four-week period, their risk goes up to about 50%. Um, anybody that goes for GI surgery and anybody who even receives peri or pre-op antibiotics. Exposure to chemotherapy or immunosuppressive agents, we touched on that. Age is actually a risk factor as well and it's because of the change in colonic flora as we age. And anybody with severe underlying illnesses, a lot of our unit patients are at risk obviously. There's some literature, um, probably um, less supportive now, but in the early 2000s and mid-2000s, we had um, a lot of discussion about proton pump inhibitors as a cause or risk factor for patients with C. diff, um, but I think that's kind of dying off. And also with fluoroquinolone use, I think in the early 2000s, um, era we were talking more about fluoroquinolone use and how that predisposes patients to C. diff and then also we were talking about which fluoroquinolone predisposes more patients to C. diff. Um, just looking at the different types of antibiotics, I know clindamycin is kind of the Everybody knows, you know, you learned that in, in pharmacy school and in medical school. I think clindamycin has is, is gotten the bad rap, but um, I think any antibiotic can give you C. diff. Um, more frequently, here are the ampicillin, amoxicillin, cephalosporins, and then less frequently reported are things like um, vancomycin, tigecycline, which actually has some C. diff activity, and I'm going to go over that in a minute, and then linazolid, there's been some rare cases of linazolid causing C. diff. Um, but overall, any antibiotic can potentially give it to you. And then this is to um, kind of go back on you know the the idea of fluoroquinolones and why different fluoroquinolones can give you um, C. diff. Um, it's not very clearly demonstrated, but the theory is that fluoroquinolones that have more anaerobic activity, such as moxifloxacin or gadifloxacin, are more likely to predispose patients than things like levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin because of their enhanced anaerobic. Um, activity, it actually kills off the normal anaerobes that are in your body and therefore predisposes a patient to C. diff. So there's conflicting literature that suggests, um, you know, there's been even um, incidences where uh, they switch fluoroquinolones on their formulary and they saw a rise in C. diff and then when they switch back the incidence of C. diff decreased, but you know there, there's also other studies that suggest that it really doesn't have an impact. So it's kind of controversial still. So touching on the toxins and the different ones, um, again, toxin A is more of a pro-inflammatory. It's more responsible for all the fluid that's created. It's an enteral toxin, whereas B is more of a cytotoxin, and it causes, um, it disintegrates the filamentous actions of the colon and causes the colon to kind of collapse. Um, the binary toxin, which is NAP1, which stands for North American um, a, a Polarized gel pharesis 1, BI for binary toxin, and the O27 is the strain. This is kind of the newest strain of um, C. diff, and this was the strain that was associated with the um, outbreak in Quebec in the early 2000. Um, and we don't really know whether or not 
people that have the strain are more likely to die from C. diff than people that do not have the strain, but we do know that um, it is a little harder to treat, and we also know that these patients do have a lot of um, diarrhea because the ability of the strain to produce toxin is a lot higher. Um, it produces you know, almost 20 times more A and B toxin than um, your normal strain would. And then the newest, the 078 strain, which was just published um, um, late last year, I think. Um, it was the first, uh, this by PCR ribotype 078. It was first reported in calves and pigs and was frequently exp um, associated with uh, people who had been exposed to fluoroquinolones. It usually affects the younger patients and, um, and we see this more commonly in our community acquired CDIs. Um, it's very genetically related to the 027 strain, um, and it has a similar incidence of diarrhea and mortality as the 027 strain. And currently, we've not been able to prove that people that have the 027 strain um, are, it's more uh, of a um, burden on mortality. Um, no one's been ever, uh, has ever been able to prove that. So. It, it's a more virulent strain, we think. It's more difficult to treat, but in, in terms of causing more mortality, we don't really know that yet. So in the late 80s, um, there was only about less than 5% of the B1027 strain. Um, and in the US and Europe, there's only about 6%. Um, it's encoded on the TCDA and TCDB genes. And what happens on the TCDC, there's actually a mutation and there's an 18 base pair deletion, um, which causes this increase 16 to 23 times more toxin production. And they, they actually produce a lot more toxin, um, A and B. The significance of mortality is unknown. Um, and it causes increased sporulation capacity facilitated spread through environmental contaminations. So on surfaces, bed rails, those sorts of things, you'll see a lot of this um, spreading through environmental surfaces. And the new definition for diarrhea and the new guidelines that were published a couple weeks ago, diarrhea um, as defined as greater than three unformed stools in 24 hours or less. Um, leukocytosis, um, patients who had a white count of greater than or equal to 15,000 are associated with a more complicated disease, and then patients with a leukocytosis or a white count greater than 50,000 are associated with what they classify as a catastrophic disease. Um, some of these patients um, will have the fever, abdominal distension we talked about, and then other things they'll present with are the malaise, pain, and then anorexia. So diagnosis, if you choose to do endoscopy and evidence of pseudomembers colitis, that's um, classic or standard diagnosis for C. diff um, infection. Um, otherwise, testing on diarrheal stools, um, unless an ileus is present, is usually done. And there's different ways of doing tests. For the most part, I think the most common test um, is the ELISA immunoassay. Um, it detects both toxins A and B. It's um, pretty, the turnaround time is, is, it's pretty quick. It's easy to perform and it has a high specificity. The only problem is it, it doesn't really have a high sensitivity and some sites are recommending that if you have an EIA test that's negative that you follow that up and you have a high suspicion that the patient has C. diff that you would actually follow that up with a a, a supplemental test. Um, the cytotoxin assay, I don't think very many sites are using that because it only detects toxin B. Um, it, it does have high sensitivity and specificity, um, but it does require tissue culture um, and it takes the turnaround time is, is delayed. PCR, although expensive, I think some sites are converting to that um, because it does detect toxin A and B gene, it's rapid, and it does offer, um, provide the high specificity and sensitivity. We're not doing PCR, but I think uh, some sites locally are doing PCR now. I don't know if it's um, Tampa Journal, does Tampa Journal do PCR yet? 
Yeah. Um, they still do EIA, yeah. Haven't we sent out some PCRs from Moffitt or never? Not that I'm aware of. We ended up doing Yeah. Um, the lateness, um, latex agglutination test, um, basically you're trying to detect a bacterial enzyme. It's fast, it's in inexpensive, but it, it's, I don't think it's used much anymore because it has poor sensitivity and specificity. And the last one, the stool culture, um, that test is usually used for more epidemiologic um, to see if um, which strain of the C. diff to try to isolate which um, if you have an outbreak or something like that. So I've kind of ranked these based on the, the feasibility or the, the popularity of, of the, the, how these tests are done. So before we go into the actual treatment of C. diff, I just kind of wanted to highlight um, this, the new guideline that's, that's published. Um, and this was interesting because prior to this, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of, you know, what to do in terms of globally controlling antibiotic use. But now for the first time, they've actually emphasized, you know, in order to control C. diff, you really have to globally try to reduce um, and minimize the frequency and duration of antimicrobial therapy and the number of antimicrobial agents prescribed. And that's actually highlighted in the new guidelines. Because, you know, if, if you're kind of just silo-ly treating the C. diff, um, th you're really not doing the whole job. Um, so what they had actually recommended in the new guidelines is implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs to try to help globally control antimicrobial use, restricting antibiotic use based on local epidemiology. So I thought that was pretty important in this new guideline. And the first thing, um, if you have a high suspicion of C. diff, um, if you possibly can, stopping the inciting antibiotic as soon as possible. I know in some cases it's not very um, feasible because you have a critically ill patient in the unit, but if at all possible, try to um, decrease the antibiotic burden on the patient. And then in terms of non-antibiotic management, we want to make sure we correct fluid loss and electrolyte imbalances in these patients, avoid antiperistaltic agents, and this is actually recommended in the new guidelines because it says it obscures the symptoms and precipitates toxic megacolant. I know sometimes in the past we've used it. Um, we've tried to limit our use of antiperistaltic agents, though. Um, they also remind us that we need to activate infection control policies place these patients in isolation. These rooms need to be cleaned with bleach and chlorine, um, not just your typical um, surface cleaners that we use. Consider surgical intervention for severely ill patients, and then also initiate empirical antibiotic treatment as soon as the diagnosis is suspected. For the treatment, it's now classified um, under initial whether patient has mild, severe, or severe complicated CDI. For a mild to moderate, and it's defined as anyone with a WBC less than or equal to 15,000, and the serum creatinine less than or equal to 1.5 times the pre-morbid level. And the rationale behind this is if they're having a lot of diarrhea, they may become dehydrated, and people with a higher serum creatinine may be more dehydrated and have a poorer outcome than patients that aren't as dehydrated. <clears throat> and the recommendation for your mild to moderate patient is still the metronidazole, 500 milligrams POTID times 10 to 14 days. And your severe patients where patients have an elevated white count and their serum creatinine is higher than the 1.5 times the baseline, then the recommendation is vancomycin, 125 milligrams POQID. In severe or complicated cases where patients are hypotensive, septic, they may have an ileus or they have a megacolon, the recommendation is to use elevated dose of 500 milligrams vancomycin QID. And I know there's some discussion on email about this. Um, some practitioners, you know, would load them up front with the 500 milligrams and then maybe taper them down to the 250 or the 125. I know earlier on there was some literature that suggested there was no difference if you use the higher dose versus a lower dose. But this is directly from the guidelines and that's why I have it here on the slide. Um, they also recommend the addition of IV metronidazole 
And in cases where you have a patient who has an ileus, they also recommend adding vancomycin as a retention enema. So a patient with an ileus in a severe case may potentially be on all three agents. If a patient has a fr first recurrence, the recommendation is to stratify them by their disease. So if they started out with a mild to moderate disease and now they've got a recurrence and they may have a more severe disease, then you would stratify them and provide the vancomycin in this case. <clears throat> the recommendation is also to avoid metronidazole beyond the first recurrence. So if you've already uh, you know, tried metronidazole the second time, then the third time definitely do not go straight to the vancomycin. And then second or later recurrences, vancomycin taper or pulse therapy is recommended. And that's when you start with the vancomycin QID and then taper them down to the BID over seven days, and eventually down to um, every Q day, every two to three days, and then um, off. And that's to um, allow the colonic flora to refer, flur flourish and also to um, reduce the um, sporulation of the um, C. diff. Looking at some adjuvant alternative therapies, um, probiotics is, is something that's um, talked about in the literature or could be used. Other things like toxin binders, cholestyramine or cholestopol, nitazoxanide, um, rifamycins like rifampin or rifaximin, tenidazole, tigecycline, IVIG, and even stool transplants. These agents weren't heavily discussed in the new guidelines, but I'm going to go ahead and touch on some of those. With probiotics, um, the, the most common ones are the Saccharomyces lactobacillus, um, the um, bifidobacterium. They're available over the counter at, at health food stores. Um, there's really limited data to support the routine use of probiotics. Um, and the reason is because there's potential risk of bloodstream infections, particularly case reports of people um, who are giving lactobacillus, who developed lactobacillus um, bloodstream infections. However, there has been some case reports and some meta-analysis to support that use of probiotics um, can actually help patients with severe disease reduce the recurrence and also reduce the um, the uh, incidence of diarrhea. So, you know, it's it's controversial whether probiotics help. Um, I think for uh, some patients who may be at low risk for bloodstream infections, it, it probably wouldn't hurt to to um, buy these products and have them use it. Um, but you know, I don't know how much benefit and hasn't been really been studied. It, they're pretty benign products. Um, otherwise. Ninazoxanide has been on the market for a few years now. We've had some experience with this use in CDI. It's a thiazolide agent. It's not FDA approved for C. diff. It's only FDA approved for Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Its mechanism of action is by um, inhibiting the pyruvate ferrodoxin oxyroreductase enzyme. Um, it has activity against protozoal or um, helminthic intestinal parasites and enteric anaerobes, and it has actually really good activity against H. pylori. Um, usually we'll use this agent if patients fail the standard metronidazole, flagyl, or uh, vancomycin regimens, and it's usually given just a short course, 500 milligrams POBID times three days. It's recommended in HIV positive patients that you extend the course to 14 days. Rifaximin is a synthetic um, analog of rifampin. Um, it's only FDA approved for traveler's diarrhea. Um, it has poor bioavailability, which is actually good in this case if we're treating C. diff infections. Um, and that's one of the criticisms of metronidazole because it's actually very well absorbed. Um, and you actually want to use an agent that's poorly absorbed so it can get down to the colon and treat your C. diff infection. Um, in vitro activity against C. diff is, is pretty good. Um, what I think rifaximin now has been used more for is what we call the rifaximin chaser. Um, and basically these are patients that you might have treated them with metronidazole the first round, they have a recurrence and you give them the, um, you know, you may have 
tr rechallenge them with the metronidazole. Third time around, you give them the vancomycin. You may want to finish it up with this what's called a rifaximin chaser, and you want to finish up the 14 days of the vancomycin, and then kind of give them another seven days or so the rifaximin. Um, we haven't really used rifaximin as a first line or even a second line agent, and I don't really think the data really supports its use as a first or second line agent. Um, you know, it's mainly used in people who have multiple relapsing disease um, after the 14-day course, and, and the re main reason is because of the development of resistance with rifaximin. Tinidazole, um, it's actually a structural analog of metronidazole, um, and it's not FDA approved for C. diff again. Um, it does have in vitro activity for C. diff, um, and I think we've used it maybe once or twice at most, but um, it's usually reserved as a third, maybe even fourth line agent. Tigecycline is an interesting one. It's an IV formulation only. It's not available as PO. It does have a good in vitro activity against C. diff, and there's been four case reports of the use of tigecycline in patients with refractory C. diff. Um, we have actually tried it a couple times in the VA. Um, there's four cases in the case report, three failed standard treatments, and there was one patient who was used um, in an initial regimen. Um, they gave the tigecycline 100 milligram loading dose and then 50 milligrams Q12, so how it's usually dosed. Um, three of the cases they gave it with um, vancomycin or flagell, and only one case they used tigecycline as monotherapy. The treatment duration for these patients were anywhere between 7 and 21, 24 days. Um, they received um, uh, symptom relief after tigecycline started for about three to seven days. And then toxin negativity was detected at three to 13 days. So there was a range of toxin detect um, negativity. And after three months, none of these um, four cases had a relapse of their C. diff. So just a thought. Um, I don't think um, Pfizer is going after this indication at this point, but you know, and it does obviously doesn't have the FDA approved indication for this, but there is some literature surfacing regarding its use in C. diff. IVIG um, s contains I IgG antitoxin A. Um, there's been some case reports um, primarily in children with using um, IVIG for C. diff infections. Um, mainly these were in severe cases. Um, three patients responded, one had a partial response, and there was one failure. So it's kind of controversial whether this would be benefit, but it's in the literature. And then lastly, um, stool transplants um, is actually, um, there's always a lot of discussion about this, um, whether this needs to go through IRB because it's really research or, you know, do you need to informed consent to get stool transplants and, and that sort of thing. But there are some cases in the literature and I just kind of wanted to share this with you. Um, so the, this was, um, this is stool transplants by NG tube. Um, to treat C. diff infections. They received um, 30 grams, put in 50 to 70 mLs of normal saline. Um, it was homogenized in a coffee blender and then administered along with the uh, vancomycin, 250 milligrams, Q8 hours times four days. And also PPI was given <laughs> as well. There was 18 patients. Oh, yeah. Um, there were 18 patients in the studies. Two patients um, actually died at the end of the study. Se 17 of the 18 patients sustained clinical response and toxin negativity. One out of the 18 had a relapse at 17 days. There were no ADRs reported, and most patients responded within 12 to 24 hours after administration of the donor stool. Um, this was another one, and this one actually received the daughter's donated stool. This was a 69-year-old male, status post-radical prostatectomy. Um, he had an ileus, oligurate renal failure postoperatively, fevers, HAP on Piptazo. 
um, initially started on IV metronidazole for C. diff, had um, extensive pseudomembranous colitis and received the daughter's donated stools and responded. So it's in the literature. Um, every now and then I'll hear about it on listservs and people will comment about, you know, the technicality of doing this and the consent and all the research and all of that. I personally I haven't experienced have you have you done any of this? No. You wouldn't want to give it to them right here. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of stool around, but it doesn't sound like something. You might just have to go to the stomach. Why can't you just pass that leash into the chamber? Yeah, it's it's very impalatable. Yeah. Um. Just touching on some future options, these agents are not FDA approved yet. Um, phytazomycin is actually, um, it was just presented in Finland in April and it had very promising results. It's a novel 18 member macro cyclic cycle antibiotic. It works by inhibiting RNA polymerase. It actually has moderate activity against other gram positive organisms such as staph and enterococci. And in its phase three randomized clinical trial, which was just presented in Finland at some big meeting um, just this month or last month, um, had very promising results. Patients who receive um, phytozomycin, um, 200 milligrams BID, um, had a 91.7% cure rate versus the vancomycin 125 QID at 90%. So the conclusion was it's not inferior to vancomycin. And if you look at the recurrence rate, it was quite impressive as well. Only 12% had a recurrence rate in the phytozomycin group versus vancomycin had about a 25% recurrence rate. So it's pretty promising. Um, you know, they're working on uh, applying for uh, NDA for FDA approval, and it should happen. I mean, they, they're applying it for this month, so we'll see what happens. You may hear more about it in the near future. Ramoplanin is in phase three trials. Um, it's actually bactericidal. Um, and it was kind of moving along until the company that originally started and study the agent sold it to nano therapeutics so I think in the transition there's been some delays in the study but it has in vitro activity again against um, other gram positive pathogens um, and cross resistance has not been documented with um, vancomycin and other glycopeptides because it works by inhibiting peptidoglycan synthesis so there was a little concern about whether it would have cross reactivity or cross resistance with vancomycin but th that has not been demonstrated Vaccines, there's been um, studies looking at C. diff vaccinations. Um, Sanofi Aventis is taking that on, and um, right now it's in phase two trials. Um, it's a formulin and activated C. diff toxoid vaccine, um, and it's been demonstrated to have efficacy in several animal models. Um, right now it's in phase two trials in humans, and it's actually um, an IM injection and you give it in three phases. You give it at zero days, seven days, which is one week later, and then at the end of the month, 28 day mark. So it's three injections. Um, there was 30 patients studied, and the results were they found a 50-fold increase in the concentration of antitoxin A, IgG, when the vaccine was given to these patients. And they're actually currently enrolling. There's actually a site in Tampa that's enrolling. So I don't know if you guys know, because when I went onto the website to see who was enrolling, there was a site in Tampa enrolling. Monoclonal antibodies. Um, this was published in January, New England Journal of Medicine, looking at monoclonal antibodies against C. diff toxin, and I thought it was very promising information. Lowy's group looked at this um, up in Massachusetts. Um, there's actually two human monoclonal antibodies that are targeted for C. diff. There's a CDA1 and a CDB1. Um, it's uh, given as a single infusion dose 10 milligrams per kilo body weight of each of those. So they looked at um, 
those that got the monoclonal antibody versus placebo or standard of care who just got the PO treatments um, and um, what they found at the end of the 84 days to see if there was recurrence the people that got the antibody only had a 7% recurrence rate versus the people that got the standard of care or placebo um, experienced a 25% recurrence rate so this was kind of up and coming as well. Telemar, um, I think, has actually died or is dying, unfortunately. Um, it was a novel non-antibiotic um, polymer, very high molecular weight, and the way it works is it binds the toxin. Um, during its phase two trials, it had pretty promising results. Um, there were 544 patients who received Televimar um, times 14 days versus the vancomycin times 10 days versus the metronidazole. Um, so they went ahead and, and went forth with the phase 3 trial. But in 2007, I think 2008, um, their phase 3 trial showed that it was no better, it was not better, or actually it was worse than met vancomycin metronidazole for all disease severity. So I, th I don't think the company is going forth with this anymore. I'm not sure if we're going to hear more about this product. But it's a non-antibiotic, um, and it, it just binds the toxin. And then I found this agent, which is, um, I guess it's pronounced nicin. Um, it's actually a natural f food preservative, and it's actually in some of the foods that we eat now. And it's produced by Lactococcus lactis, and um, it works by preventing spore overgrowth. Um, and it has significant in vitro activity against C. diff. So this is actually being looked at as well um, as a preservative um, to help treat C. diff as well. And then lastly, I just wanted to emphasize infection control procedures. Um, you know, the key is to limit the use of antimicrobial drugs, and the guidelines, again, emphasize the importance of developing antimicrobial stewardship programs, washing hands between contact with patients, um, enforcing contact isolation precautions, um, wearing gloves, using appropriate disinfectant, unlike some of the other resistant organisms where um, the rooms have to be just cleaned out and the surface cleaned with Virax and, and that sort of thing. Patients who have C. diff and some of the other um, gastrointestinal infections like norovirus actually require chlorine um, to be wiped down, use, use chlorine to wipe down all the surfaces. So we need to kind of educate the staff and make sure everybody knows about that. And also hand gels that we always carry in our in our pockets and in the walls of the hospital um, doesn't really work for some of these spore forming organisms. So, you know, getting the message out to the staff and other members of the family and that sort of thing to let them know. And I just wanted to finish with this, and this was a study that was published in CID a couple of years ago, and basically they were able to control C. diff outbreak by doing some of these things, education, increase in early case finding, they expanded their infection control measures, they actually developed a um, C. diff infection management team, so they actually went out as, you know, and tried to um, tr uh, you know, proactively try to investigate some of these um, outbreaks or be before the outbreak, try to um, educate and, and they formed, I, I guess they were called huddles, where they would go to the ward and try to get the staff together and do a really quick and dirty education piece to the staff and they were able to control this outbreak. And that is all I had.